Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, I want to share with you a message entitled, Riders on the Storm. And I know a lot of you all of a sudden went to the doors. <laughs> Stop, okay? Uh, but yes, Riders on the Storm. Uh, and and since, since Stacy and I are now empty nest people... at least until Christmas break, um, uh, we have been able to spend a lot of time together. And one of the things that we have started doing is we started re-watching some old shows. Uh, and we have nearly finished uh, the entire series of Bones. And, and if you know what Bones is, um, great. But if not, it's a, about a forensic anthropologist and her uh, FBI husband and their research team that they, they solve just... They solve crazy stuff, all right? And one of the things that I noticed the other day was that uh, Bones, as, as the anthropologist is called, she always goes back to the Bones themselves and spends countless hours constantly poring over them. Sometimes one bone at a time for what seems like an eternity. And, and in fact, she may look at one bone, solve the crime, and then go back and find even more stuff she hadn't noticed in the bones. And this was encouraging because anything worth knowing well is worth spending as much time as possible with so that you know inside and out. In fact, uh, this is the best way to study scripture. I, I, I use that because studying scripture is not just reading the verse of the day. And studying scripture is not just a five-minute Passover of a passage of a, a section of scripture. It's, it's more than just reading through the Bible in a year and, and, and all of those things. If you want to get to know scripture, you spend time. You meticulously walk through. Uh, not just what you see, but what you don't see. You, you stare into the text and... Don't, don't, not just visualizing yourself in that text, you visualize the text from everything that's around it. And, and so I have made this, as most of you know, this is, this is my practice. Um, I dig into a passage of scripture and commentaries are the last thing that I go to. I don't, I don't go to a commentary because if I go to a commentary, what I'm getting is what somebody else thinks. And I want to hear what the Lord says first and then go to a commentary and see if it backs up. But I'm going to be meticulous in going through Scripture, almost examining it. And sometimes we get lost in the grammar and all of that. But yes, getting, getting down to the words, to, to uh, applying the definitions of words to the context of those words, to the context of the, the manner and reasons for, for something being written. So, uh, you know, we... Uh, this is, this is our, our practice, and I put this also into our, our Wednesday nights. By the way, if you're not coming on Wednesday nights, you will hear me say this every week until all of you are coming on Wednesday nights. I want you to come on Wednesday nights. Um, in fact, the, the, the spark for this message kind of happened out of... A, a conversation we had Wednesday night um, as we were closing up. And I'm, I'm going to credit this person because they struck a chord in me that caused me to search. And I had made the statement that Jesus was the only person to walk on water. To which Daniel comes up to me after service and says, there's actually the Bible records there are two. And I was like, you know, you're absolutely right about that. And it wasn't that I had dismissed that, that, uh, that there was another person in there. It's just in the moment I, I, was, I was trying to make a point, And you know, sometimes we just get lost in it all. But it, what it caused me to do was it caused me to stop. And, and it put that little nugget inside of me that says, okay, when Daniel says something like that, it's not, it's not just because he wants to one-up conversation. It's, I believe... Uh, sometimes I get little nuggets of where God wants to go through conversations that I've had. Uh, and, and so um, it tells me a thought or it gives me something to search. And, and nine times out of ten, the Lord speaks to me in, in those ways. And so Daniel comes to me and he says, man, that's not the case. He reminds me, Peter also walked on the water. And, 
And it got me thinking about that passage so much that I couldn't shake it. So, so here we are, and I want to dive into it this morning as I've kind of talked about it. I used a little bit of Bones method, if you will, uh, to dig into this passage. And, and I challenge you not just with a good word, but to gain a new perspective on faith and this walk with Jesus. Now, I know that today is September 11th, and I do not minimize that it is September 11th. A lot of churches all over uh, right now are, are having their memorials. They're having their uh, carved out times, and they're showing videos, and they're showing all of these things, and, and they're reminding everyone to remember. And the reality is, is everyone remembers. We all know where we were. And, and, and in fact, that was... 20 years ago, okay, and it was, and, and that doesn't minimize because it was 20 years ago, and of course, this week, we know that the queen passed away. We're not going to talk about the queen passing away, but we're going to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that there are things that are moving in our world today. There are there are things that have been set in motion in our world today that if we're not paying attention to it, we're going to miss the bigger picture. Because it's not just that the queen died, and it's not just that it's the 20th anniversary of 9-11, one of the most tragic days in all of the United States history and all of that stuff. It's, it's that if we're not stepping back and seeing the bigger picture of eternity here where we're not grasping where we really sit uh, in the context of world events. I can tell you this, that um, I can't help but think that we have begun to move into a full swing of end times prophetic revelations that will begin to stir up. I don't want to scare you. I don't want to, I don't want to do any of those things. But I just want you guys to understand that the Bible is real. That what the Bible says is absolutely true. And, and, and when the Bible comes into prophetic language, sometimes it's taken in the context of a few years after it was said. Sometimes it's taken into the context of a couple of decades or a century or two or three after it was said. And sometimes it's right on up to the very end of days. And I believe that we are seeing fulfillments, we are seeing things happening, we are seeing all kinds of, of we call it garbage, we call it mo uh, 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 paper and, and information, and, and we call it all of this stuff that we can gripe and complain about, and, and we, look at the, we look at our streets, and we look at our communities, and we look at our government, and we look at the world, and we, go, we think to ourselves, my goodness, could it get any worse? And so we start thinking, yeah, it could always get worse, and, and, and then we say these little moments of Christianity that say things like, but Jesus is still king. And it's true. And we say things like, oh, it's going to get darker before the dawn. Yes. And we say things like, oh, Jesus is coming soon. And what changes? Because we start up the next day griping and complaining about what's going on. We start up the next. We, we start the next minute, and we're and we and nothing has changed. We just take a moment to step back and go. Well, you know Jesus, <sighs> and it's ugly. And I want to share with you this this message, and and in fact, it was kind of funny. And and I'll. I, not to be cheesy, but as I was thinking about this and thinking about the end times and all of that, it, it, it stirred a couple of thoughts of a couple of different songs uh, in my heart. And, and here's, here's some lyrics from some of these songs. Uh, some of you uh, will should know these songs. One of them is, uh, they're both entitled People Get Ready. Um, listen to this, People Get Ready, uh, Jesus is Coming, Soon We'll Be Going Home. Um, people get ready. Jesus is coming to take from the world his own. Or, or what about this one? You may, some of you, um, lovely or older generation, may appreciate this one. People get ready. There's a train a coming. Don't need no baggage. Just get on board. All you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. I, I, honestly, I'm going to tell you, I've not really ever just read the lyrics to this 
Don't need no ticket. You just thank the Lord. So people get ready for the train to Jordan, picking up passengers coast to coast. Faith is the key. Open the doors and board them. There's hope for all among the loved the most. And then this one, this, this line seems very controversial, but you've got to understand it in what he's saying. There ain't no room for the hopeless sinner who would hurt all mankind just to save his own. Now, if you were to stop at the first phrase, we'd all get offended. But when you understand the second phrase, he's saying there is no room for people who are staying in their hopelessness of sin and destroying others saying there's got to be a change that takes place. Have pity on those whose chances grow thinner because there's no hiding place against the kingdom's throne. Boy, the temptations just knew how to write a song. Eternity is more important than the temporal. It is what matters most. So don't get too bogged down. But I want to challenge you today because given the uncertainty, given, given the prophetic reality, given, given the, the, the things that are going on today, not just in the world and in our town, but in your lives, listen, the devil has been playing hardball with all of us. Uh, he, he's been messing around with, with minds and bodies and, and, and marriages and relationships. And, and, and there's all of this destruction that's going on. And, and we need to understand that the whole point behind all of the trial and tribulation of the enemy is to distort the image of God. It's, and if he can do it by destroying you, then he's done the best job he possibly can. Because we are the body of Christ, therefore the image of the living God. We, we are part of that image. And so you need to understand that what we've seen and what's going on is all coming to the point of the enemy trying to destroy the one thing that God cares about the most, and that is you. And so... in these days of uncertainty and craziness and prophetic reality... I want to challenge you this morning to embrace your position as a rider on the storm. As a rider on the storm. There's three passages of scripture I've already made mention. You kind of know where I'm going. We're going to go to talk about the time that Jesus walked on the water and so did Peter. And so we're, we're going to go to all three places where this story is written in Scripture. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, and it's in John. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. There's a lengthy passage, but I promise you when we get to the end, you'll actually, I believe, possibly be excited and shouting by the end. And I, I, I pray. Uh, so Matthew 14, 22 through 33, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. Isn't that awesome? He didn't even say, Peter, get out of the boat. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Let's go to Mark chapter 6. Verses 47 through 52. Amen. When you're there? Mark chapter 6, 47 through 52. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant 
to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. He got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Huh, that one doesn't mention that Peter walked on the water. But it's all the same story. John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about... Three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. This is cool. And immediately, the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now, the geographical location of the Sea of Galilee or the Lake Genesaret is in the low place between mountainous regions in the northern part of Israel. Here's the dimensions so that you understand the Sea of Galilee. It is 14 miles long. It is 8 miles wide. It covers roughly 64 square miles. 64 square miles. A storm can hit this lake so quickly because the wind comes sweeping down into the bowl that is the sea and within seconds it can go from peaceful to 18 foot waves and swells. Fishermen have died because of sudden storms that hit this body of water. And this is important to remember because storms don't come when you want them or need them. But I'm going to, put, I'm going to, tra- to uh, uh, challenge your faith. Storms come when they're necessary. Storms don't come when you want them. We don't, rain doesn't come when we want it or when we need it. It comes when it's necessary. Storms in our lives don't come when we want them. In fact, we don't ever want them, but storms come when they are necessary. And so today I, I want to share with you this, be, how to be a rider on the storm. Jesus shows us and scripture gives us some insight here to understand how to be a rider on the storm. And, and so number one, understand this, Jesus walked on the water. Let me say it this way. Jesus isn't afraid of storms. Two times Jesus has been recorded as being on the water with the disciples. And in both moments, a storm arose. And if Jesus wasn't asleep, he was on a stroll. Get that picture. One story tells us Jesus was asleep in the bottom of the boat and they wake him up for fear that they will all die. And he kind of yawns, looks up at the sky and says, Silence! Oh, the king of heaven has spoken. And the other time, the storm has risen. The disciples are freaking out because it's, the winds are contrary. They have rowed for four miles. Now, I have not ever been on a row machine for anything longer than about 30 seconds because I break down and almost die on those machines. If you know what I'm talking about, those row machines where you're just, oh, 30 seconds and I'm done. If it, these guys were for four miles against the wind. A, these fishermen were buff. These are good-shaped men, okay? So don't, don't, don't get that twisted. All right. But here it is. The storm rises, and there is fear. There's agitation. They're rowing. They're struggling. And here's Jesus in the middle of a storm walking on the water. 
See, now, as storms most of the time represent trial or trouble in our lives, notice that the reason Jesus wasn't afraid of them was because he expected them. Don't believe me? Then why would, John, why would Jesus say this in John? I have shown you these things so that in me you might have peace. In this world you will find troubles of all kinds. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In other words, you can't be afraid of what you expect. And you can't be timid because of what you know is coming. Now, I, I hope to raise some warriors today. Okay, nobody wants to be a warrior. All right. Bless you. We will have a very brief altar call here in just a second, and we will all go home. The offering has already been taken, so if you, you know, we can, we can, all of the stuff we're supposed to do for church today has happened. So if, if, if we don't need to go any further, then we don't have to. See, you can only walk boldly in its face, walking as the master did. Proverbs 28.1 says this, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. I want you to hear that. It's not that the righteous are bold when no one pursues. It's the righteous are bold all the time. But the wicked flee even when no one is after them. When nothing is against them, they still run. When it's, so if they will run when nothing's against them, imagine what the wicked do when everything seems to be against them. So that's why the contrast, the righteous, those who are in right standing with God, are bold regardless of the situation. This is boldness in the face of fear, boldness in the face of uncertainty, and always expecting what is unexpected. You've got to understand, Jesus knew how to speak peace and walk in peace in the midst of storms that were intended to bring destruction. Jesus was not afraid of the storm. He says, in me you have peace because storms will come. Expect the storm and in the storm be bold. Walk as Jesus walked. Church, if we would get this, we would not tuck tail and run when a storm comes. We would walk the way Jesus walked, not shocked when the storm happens. We've got to get to this understanding. Jesus said this in this world. That's and he's not talking to the world. He says in this world, believers, storms come. And he spoke that so that you would not go, I can't believe a storm showed up. Oh God, why are we going through this? I'm going to need six weeks of counseling. Last week we heard that we need to trust the peace of God and the God of peace. Because why? Because he is our source of peace who speaks peace. Don't lose the sight that says even the wind and waves obey yeah. him. Yeah. Church, we've, we've got to, just on that alone, we could probably spend forever, but we've got to understand we are in Christ. Yeah. He walked on waves. We walk on waves. He was expecting the unexpected. He was not afraid of the storm. He walked on the storm. He was not afraid of the storm. He spoke peace in the storm, and the storm obeyed him. The righteous are as bold as lions. In the middle of all that's going on in the world right now, the one thing that needs to be seen by the world is the church being righteously bold and walking in the same trouble that everyone else is walking, yet we walk on top of it rather than are made subject to it. Do, do you understand what I'm talking about? We've got we've to get this. Now, number two, I want you to get this. And, and remember, we've done what Bones does. Bones goes back to the bones and begins to study every detail. So number two is don't miss the boat. Don't miss the boat. I can't tell you in 30 years of listening to people preach on this passage of Scripture, the boat has always represented one thing, comfort zone. 
And we always preach, step out of the boat. But we miss that Jesus told them to be in the boat. The boat is not a comfort zone, ladies and gentlemen. The boat is obedience. Don't miss that. Jesus told them in all three locations they got into a boat. One doesn't, uh, doesn't allude that Jesus told them. Matthew and Mark says Jesus instructed them to go in the boat and go to the other side. The boat is not a comfort zone in this passage of Scripture. The boat is not a place where they just kind of thing like Jonah did trying to run from the prophetic word of the Lord and obedience to God. The boat is obedience. We cannot miss the fact that Jesus commanded them to be in the boat. If the boat were a comfort zone, then he would have commanded them to walk to the other side instead of get in a boat. Don't miss that the boat was a vehicle of purpose that Jesus had placed them in. The story tells us that they were rowing in that boat, so the purpose was functional. The boat represents obedience. They were obeying their Lord. Where they got off was when the storm unexpectedly hit them. Okay, I'm going to keep going, and then I'm going to preach on this for a second. Listen, if the boat is purpose... And we can see that the purpose may be, listen, being a mom or dad, being a husband or wife, being in ministry or a volunteer service. The comfort zone is not getting out of the boat. The comfort zone is jumping ship. There's a difference between getting out of the boat and jumping ship. Oh, y'all don't, y'all, y'all don't want to hear that. Because jumping ship is, is, is just... I'm tired of this. Get out of here. I'm so sick of this world that I walk around this mountain. I'm continuously going. Why is it that we have four days of good and seven days of bad? And I'm just tired of the roller coaster. I'm jumping ship. This is why the divorce rate in the church is the same as the divorce rate in the world. Because we jump ship. Ministry gets hard and we jump ship. Oh, I don't think God called me to that. Oh, that's not in my giftings anymore. Why? Because you had a storm, you think? that? Let me tell you something. Speaking from personal experience, and I know I'm young. (laughs) I know I'm not that young anymore, okay? <laughs> but Stacy and I have been married for a while. And we've been in ministry for 25 years. And in 25 years, we've had our share of storms. And I promise you, there were days that jumping ship seemed like the really good idea. There seemed like there were days that I wish I would have just left the keys at the front door to the house and the church, packed up the family, and left. And it wasn't because storms were people. It's because storms are storms. And the thing is, is that we've sold church people a bill of goods that when they have Jesus in their life, storms just don't seem to come around anymore. Like storms are afraid of you. And we, we have built up this ability to, to confess that we don't walk in storms anymore. A- and then we lose faith when a storm happens and it becomes very destructive in our lives. I'm sure that there are moments where I would have rather thrown out the baby with the bath water. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, that sounds like abuse, Pastor. Well... I got an empty nest, so I'm reaping the benefits now that I didn't throw them out, okay? So, <laughs> I just, maybe I need to find Stacy 2.0. Don't act like none of y'all have prayed, God, just give me a new husband or wife. I, 
I need an upgrade. I don't need an upgrade. Y'all, I, I, everybody's like. <laughs> yes, finally preach. See, when Jesus picked Peter up, I, I want you to understand this. It wasn't, about, uh, it wasn't about getting out of the boat. If the boat was not important or if the boat was a comfort zone, then Jesus would have picked up Peter and they would have walked together on the water. But look at every one of the stories. Jesus picks him up, makes sure he's okay, and they walked on the water and got back in the boat. He didn't go, why are you so comfortable in the boat, Peter? I know, 30 years of hearing the same message preached and the same thoughts and the same comfort zone mentality and the same everything. And I'm not here to tell you that all of those people were wrong, but the Bible has just said it. The boat was their place of obedience. And Jesus took Peter back to the place of obedience. Because Jesus walking on the water and Peter walking on the water wasn't about faith to, walk, faith to, to get out of his comfort zone. It was, it's more than that. We're going to get into it because I don't want to jump to the conclusion and hit y'all with the dessert yet. He took them back to the boat. It was the purpose that Jesus had them in. And to get to the destination... He had called them to. Listen, Jesus has a destination for each and every one of you today. He has a plan and a path and a pattern and he has an end in mind and he puts you in a path and a boat of obedience, if you will, and he has set you in the right direction and he is, wa and he is watching as you go. And listen, Jesus didn't, set, didn't say anywhere because we've already read it. He didn't say that everything was going to be gravy. Expect the storm. Number three, stay focused. Listen, so if storms come and the boat is purpose, then Jesus walking on the water is victory over circumstances. That's good. Peter has enough, to, enough faith to say to Jesus, if it is you for real, then tell me to come out to you. This is a powerful statement. Why didn't Peter ask for Jesus to still the waters since he'd already done it once? You ever thought that question? Why didn't Jesus just tell the water to stop? Listen, why is it that we get frustrated with God when we tell him to stop the storm? And the only thing he does is he just stoops down to lift his hand. I don't want your hand. I want you to stop the storm. He could have asked. Peter could have asked him, hey, why didn't you just stop the storm? Well, because there's a difference there. Peter instead says, I want the same victory. Because, see, here's the test. Walking on the water is about victory over the storm. Walking on the water was that, is, that, is that place of knowing that, yes, the storm has come. Yes, the storm is beating up on your purpose. It's beating up on your calling, whether that's a husband, a wife, a mother, a father, uh, in ministry, in, in uh, 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 service as a volunteer, or whatever that calling may be, whatever that purpose may be, it, it, all of it is that same boat. And yes, the storm comes after it. And there's Jesus walking on the water. And isn't it funny that the gospel says that Jesus was headed to where he was sending them? In fact, John says he would have passed by. Jesus was determined. Now, I think to myself, Jesus might have had a little bit of a competitive edge to him, and he wanted to beat the boat over there. So he cheats <laughs> by walking on the water. And, and I mean, 
I'm kidding, I jest. But you know, but you understand, here he is, and the guys are all, oh, oh, ministry is so hard, marriage is so hard, being a parent is so hard, I hate this job, oh my good, take this job and shove it, I don't want to work here anymore, and, and oh, and I'm just rowing, and I'm rowing, and it's like, but God, you've got a purpose for me, and he's like, I know, you're in the purpose, just grow. And here we are, oh, and he's rowing and rowing. And there's Jesus. Jesus, you could have made this a whole lot easier by just being in the boat with us and tell the storm to stop. And Jesus is like, <laughs> could you imagine the disciples? It's a ghost. And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, no. Stop. I'm sure he's listening. He's probably listening thousands of years ahead to the latest songs that we're singing in church. He's like, yeah, that's going to be a good one. Oh, yeah. And he's just not even paying attention. And his disciples are over here freaking out. Ghost! <laughs> ah! yeah. And Jesus goes, I'm not a ghost. I'm Jesus. Is it really you, Jesus? Because you seem to have a handle on this storm thing. And if you have a handle on this storm thing, bid me to come out of the place that you've called me to so I can walk on the storm that's hitting me while I'm in the place you've called me to. Come on. All right then. Now he says stay focused. Why? Because if you watch what happens, Peter's walking along and the Bible says he saw the wind. Now I'm sorry. Listen. I've never seen the wind. I've seen what the wind does. But I've never seen the wind. You can't package wind. You can't describe what wind looks like. You can walk outside and go, well, it's windy today. How do you know? Because the willows are dancing while they weep. We don't have weeping willows around here, do we? Do Very few. I mean, there's not a whole lot. But in Oklahoma, man, they're all over my hometown, and they're like... You know, they're like, they're like Carlton, doing the Carlton all day long. I mean, that's just what they do. Uh, uh, you know, or you see the effect of the wind. You see the, the, the wind is bending the trees, and you see the tall blades of grass and the people with the unmown yards, and they're like, woo, and it's come sweeping in waves. And you always see what the wind does. And so here's Peter. He's walking along. He's like, man, I got this, I got this. And he stops, and he goes, Do you see what the wind is doing? It's creating bigger waves to come at me. And the moment Peter took his eyes off of victory, he began to sink. And he cries out, Lord, save me! And Jesus goes, isn't this crazy? And pulls him up out of the water. Uh, now, I don't know what that looks like. I've never seen somebody climb out of water. I know y'all are thinking about it now. What does that look like? It's not like he pulled him up to the edge of a pool or something and he was able to have something sturdy to get up on. Jesus pulled him up out of the water. A man probably his own size, maybe a little bigger. And he pulls him up out of the water and sets him on top of the wave. And he says, dude, where was your faith? In other words, why would you quit looking at me? Not why did you stop believing, because Peter never quit believing that Jesus was the Son of God, that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was anything more than Jesus had ever said he was. He just quit looking at him. And Peter goes, why Paul, or, excuse Peter, Paul, Mary, Jesus says, why'd you quit looking? Why'd you quit looking at me? And he goes, come on, let's go. And Jesus could have said, well, okay, we're only, we're halfway. Let's, I mean, what's four miles, me and you walking on the waves together and, and let everyone else kind of handle their business. That's no big deal. Let's go. No, he goes, we got to go back to the purpose. Y'all doesn't want to hear that, I know, but y'all did. We got to go back to the purpose. We got to go back to the calling. But now you know, 
I can walk on the waves just as easily as I can be in the boat with you. And so Jesus gets in the boat, and the Bible says, wow, crazy enough. John says, the Bible's at land. That's like teleportation. Jesus gets in the boat, and the Bible says the boat was hitting the shore. Other places say they just worship God. Notice when Jesus got in the boat, everyone began to focus and they declared, truly you are the Son of God, and they began to worship, and it was just this wonderful time, and they never once griped about the weather again. The storm didn't stop, church. It doesn't say that the storm ceased when he got in the boat. I'm telling you. There's more to this story than we've ever thought. See, I, I want you to understand that Satan wants you to see the wind. And Jesus wants you to see him. If Satan can get you to question the circumstances, he can get you to jump ship. Man. Now listen, I, 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 don't, want to, I don't want you to lose this. When Peter begins to sink, he cries out to Jesus. And when Jesus grabs him, he questions his belief. He raises the alarm that when you take your focus off of Jesus and begin to look at the wind, you remove faith in victory. You replace who matters with what is going on. The effects of the wind may be a very real thing. Don't diminish that the wind does do something. Those effects are very real. But Jesus says he has still overcome the world. It's thinking on what is true regardless of what may be real. Don't miss that. It's thinking on what is true regardless of what may be real. Number four. Y'all didn't think I had four points, but I do, four. Don't miss the loaves. Random, the most random statement in that entire story. They did not understand the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. What's that got to do with a boat and Jesus and storms and walking on water? What does that have to do with anything? Why would you put that there? Well, understand this. Mark, John Mark, the gospel of John Mark, is really the recordings of Peter's testimony. So he's recording what Peter was saying. And Peter apparently understood why there was such a, uh, such a ruckus in the boat during this story. He says, because they didn't understand the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. What? What on earth? Well, if you remember the story before this, this is, this is Jesus having fed the 5,000. Jesus is in an area where all the people have come out from the cities round about and they're listening to him teach. And it's amazing. There's 5,000 people that are here. It's, it's awesome. Jesus has a mega church. They're all listening to him. And his disciples are the ones who say, man, these guys need some food. And Jesus says, feed them. I'm like, we don't have enough. You know the story, but I like telling stories. We don't have enough. And Jesus says, well, what do you have? So they go around looking for food. And they happen to find some kid with five loaves and two fish. That's a whole lot of bread for a couple of pieces of fish. That's a whole lot of bread for a couple of pieces of fish. And most, most people believe that this kid was actually from one of the towns he was selling lunch. And so the disciples bought the basket from this kid. This is the implication. They bought the basket from this kid and give it to Jesus. And he says, well, obviously this is enough. Don't miss this. And then he grabs it and he blesses it and he breaks it. He's, he's got them, we know, the strategic, break them into groups of 50 and, and, and all of that. And, and, you know, and so he begins to pray and he blesses, blesses the, the food and he breaks it and he starts passing it out to the disciples. And he says, I need you to pass this to everybody. By now, you should have been done with five loaves and two fish. Oh, we need more. Okay, well, there's always more. Y'all don't miss everything that I'm saying. Don't miss the details here. 
Okay, everybody's full? Are you serious? They're full? Are you sure they're full? Okay, we can stop. Now let's pick up everything. Twelve baskets full of pieces of bread and fish. And the disciples had just experienced this. Just experienced this. And I just wonder if when Jesus says, okay, guys, go get in the boat, go to the other side. I'll, I'll, I'll meet you over there. And they're in the boat. I'm wondering if they're going, did you see that? Got to be the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Jesus took nothing and turned it into something. I, 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 look, man, Jesus is the dude. He is the real thing. I mean, good grief. Man, my arms are tired from... But man, wasn't that exciting just to be able to minister? Wasn't that awesome just to be able to minister? And, and God, wasn't that just so good that people were rolling all over the floor today in church? Wasn't that just so good? Oh, it's so awesome. And now, now Jesus is calling us to a, to a different location. It's the same, and he's put us in a purpose. And man, oh, guys, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to cramp up a little. Wait a minute. Y'all y'all feel that? We better hurry. That wind is starting to pick up. Oh my God, there's a storm. And then there's Jesus walking on the waves. And now Peter's walking, and then Peter's falling, and then Peter's and Jesus are back in the boat. And Peter says, Dude, we missed it. What did we miss? What are you saying we missed? We missed the sufficiency of his provision at any level that we're at. We missed the sufficiency of his provision at any level we are at. This is, this is powerful, church. They missed that Jesus was able to take the little and spread it to cover ministry. Isn't it sad that we're all, oh, we're in our family, there's not enough. We're, in our, we're with our kids, there's not enough. We're in ministry, there's not enough. We, we've got to have enough. We've got to have more. We've got to do more. Because see, what happened was their hearts became hardened because they put it on themselves to handle everything instead of trusting in the provision that they'd been given. Now, we don't like to hear that. We don't like to hear that. And, and how do I know that we don't like to hear that? Because we post everywhere. The, the God of the $2.99 gallon of gas is the same as the God of the $10 a gallon gas. I hate these gas prices. I spent $200 just to put 10 gallons in my car. I'm kidding, not really me. I'm just, I'm, you know, I got, a, I got a good car. It's got 10 gallons, 5 gallons to fill that thing up at half a tank. And I'm like, hey, I spent 20 bucks and I'm out. Let's go. I'm happy with that. But isn't that what we do? Oh, yes, faith! But in reality, man, I'm going to have to work more just so that I can get, make sure that I can pay for the gas and get to work and do all of this. And I got to make sure that this is happening. And I got to put food on the table and I got to do this. And, and Jesus is like, man, here I am. I'm just breaking bread and fish. Because am I not sufficient enough to be everything that you need? In your calling, in your gifting, in your family, in your relationships, at your job, whatever it may be, I'm just here. If you'll just trust in what I'm providing for you. But because they didn't trust in his provision, they started trying to overcome the storm on their own. And they would have jumped ship. They would have lost the plot. We see all of this in our world going on. And we know, listen, I'm not dumb. I pay attention. I'm not oblivious. I understand economics. I get all of it. I could talk it with the best of them. 
Can't do all the calculus for you, but I could talk all of it with you. And I can understand, oh, yes, and taxes and revenues and, 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 and all of it. I, I could discuss every little bit of it. But I serve a God who can feed a family and pay bills on a $60 paycheck. He proved himself then so I don't have to worry about when I don't have enough. Because I do. And I don't have to worry. Listen, I don't have to worry when summer comes and everybody wants to go on vacation and, 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 and people stop giving. That's a fact of church anywhere you go. And you know what? It does. In the flesh, it gets scary. Oh my gosh. What are we going to do? How are we going to make it another month? We can't do it. Well, pastor, if you would just use Dave Ramsey for the church. <laughs> you know what? That might work. And then again, Dave Ramsey doesn't have a solution for when people aren't given. Other than, but when you have a calling to minister and you know that there are things that you've got to do, you do what you got to do. And this is not being transparent and saying that, oh my God, we were down to $10 in the church account. That's not what I'm saying. I just want you to understand that God has made a way every year for the past 20 years of being here. He made a way. He made a way personally. He made a way in the church. He's made a way because he is the way. And, and I promise you that storms will come, whether it's in your family, it's in your life, it's at your job, it's in your ministry, it's whatever you've been called to, whatever purpose you are in, the boat that you are rowing across a vast sea to get to the other side. Some of you are like, man, I can see the other side. I can practically taste the sand on that side. I'm so excited to get to the end of this destination. And the last thing that anybody wants is this storm that comes up. And if we just focus on the storm, we miss the Jesus in the middle of it all. We miss the Jesus in the middle of it all. See, if we ever find ourselves saying that the provision of God is not enough to row the boat or to walk on the waves in victory, then we've become hardened in our hearts and we are turning to our own reliance to maneuver the plan towards the destination and to expedite the call. Yet Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Seems rather important then to have Jesus is to have all the provision and all the sufficiency of heaven. So how do we accomplish this? I close. You accomplish this, ladies and gentlemen, one step at a time. One step at a time. You might have multiple purposes in the boat. And that's possible. Multiple purposes in that boat. And Jesus knows it. Listen, storms may come from different angles, but it's the same Lord over all things. What do I mean by that? I close with this statement. It's the same miraculous provision that fed 5,000 and 4,000. It's the same provision that turned water into wine. It's the same provision that turned bitter water into sweet. It's the same provision that turns death into life. It's the same provision that turns failure into victory. It's the same provision that turns slavery into freedom. And it's the same provision that turns mourning into dancing. How do we, how do we get to this moment? How do we get to this place? One step at a time. One step at a time. Some of you, and I, I, try to, I, I tried to make this as broad as possible because I don't know the boat you're in. I don't know. Some of you, man, I, I, could, I, can, I, can, I can chance a guess if I want to. I can 
try to be spiritual and act like I have discerned the boat that you're in. I can do all of those things. But the fact is, is I don't know the boat that you're in. But I know the one who walks on the waves that beat your boat. And I know the one who is the provision to sustain you, to keep you in the boat. Listen, it wasn't, the miracle wasn't Peter walking on the waves. The miracle was Peter no longer despising the boat. The miracle was not Peter walking on the waves. The miracle was Peter no longer despising the boat. Some of us today, we despise the boat. We got to be honest. Whatever that boat is. I'm here to challenge you. Stop despising the boat. Get your focus back onto the one who walks on the waves. Set your heart and affections back on the one who has all the provision and has all of the peace and speaks peace. And listen, we'll get in the boat while you row it to the shore, who will get you to the other side, who will walk on the waves with you just so you know you can. This is the God that cares for you. This is the Jesus who cares for you. This is the Jesus that paid the price for you. This is the Jesus that died for you. The Jesus that rose again for you. The Jesus that is seated at the right hand of the Father for you. Who is constantly praying for you. And you know what he's praying? Lord, keep their focus on me. And so this morning, I want you to stand with me.